Hey, this is Jonathan Gillum. I'm about to start the show. And it is Wednesday, a little bit later in the day than I normally start the show. And I want to just give you your tasking for the day. Maybe it'll carry it into tomorrow. And so here it is. When you watch television or you listen to the radio and you hear somebody's opinion who quotes themselves as an expert or who is the analyst that uh, the, the media is putting up there to represent an opinion or a fact, I want you to take just a few minutes and I want you to research who they are. You can type their name into whatever browser that you're using and look at who they really are. I want you to especially concentrate on how they got to where they are. What is their background? What is their early life as Wikipedia likes to put it? And I think it's going to be very surprising to you how little experience the majority of these people are that are telling you the way things are. So go do that and let's start the show. Jonathan Gillen back in the podcast called the experts because it's all about experts and expert analysis people who have real experience and the truth has arrived as always and today is very interesting because the president you know the, the, this guy is one of the reasons why I voted for him I know I, I say that, I start that out in the the liberals who uh, are probably tuned into this uh, saying, what is this podcast the expert's all about? They immediately tune out when I say something about supporting Trump. But listen, if that is if that is your trigger, you've got problems. You need to go really check out what you, what is it that's motivating you to be angry? Well, he said he grabbed a woman or he, you know, he says things that are rude and unpresidential. You need to sit down and look at what he's done as opposed to the way that you feel about something that he said. I think if you do that, well, I don't think anything's going to happen because I think you're brainwashed. But listen, I try to give credit to the people that I know that are liberal. And sometimes they come around, as I spoke about in yesterday's show, some people do come around and they see the reality, especially when they go and see things in person about what's happening. Um, maybe they don't change their views about, you know, like they like social programs or this and that. Re- listen, the reality is that has nothing to do with liberal and conservative the way that, that, that uh, politicians and political parties use it. Okay. If you're following what a political party says right now, you're not thinking for yourself. You need to think what is best to sustain the Constitution. First and foremost, that is what you should be thinking about. If a presidential candidate or a governor or a mayor or a congressman or senator or state senator, state representative, judge, sheriff, whoever, if the first thing you should be asking them, if you get up in front of them is, and I don't care, again, if you consider yourself liberal or conservative, the first thing that you should be asking them is, what do you feel about the Constitution? Do you feel that the Bill of Rights needs to be amended or changed? Why do you feel that? And what are you willing to do to sustain the Constitution and protect it from all enemies, both foreign and domestic? If they can't answer those questions, or if they even remotely allude to changing any of that, get away from them. They are dangerous. And if they lean to the left and support the Democrat Party, you can guarantee that they are in league with communism. And I know on all the trolls on Twitter and and Facebook, and yes, even LinkedIn. I'm going to tell you about an experiment I did with LinkedIn. I haven't revealed that until now, but I'll tell you about that. 
but these trolls they when you say communism they you know they go after that word because they want to downplay that because there are i've said this for a long time you know i used to host sean hannity's radio show when he was gone i used to be the one of the main people that would host that show in fact i was the only one at least i was told by the producer i'm the only one that was hosting the show that when i hosted it all of the affiliates carried that show other people, several of the affiliates would play the best of Sean Hannity. But when I hosted it, every affiliate played that show. Why? Well, I believe it's because I tell it like it is. I don't sugarcoat it. I don't try to make it seem like, you know, uh, whatever is great in the headlines is what I'm going to focus on the most. Because the headlines, as I've told uh, over and over, one of the, my, the first show that I did, I talk about how the headlines are the, the first liar when it comes to the news. So when I talk about communism on social media and these leftist trolls and people think of oh, communism, you know, the, the, the trolls are trying to downplay it because people are actually out there saying that they are communists. And so when I was hosting uh, Hannity's radio show and I was doing uh, more and more op-eds, um, which, quite frankly, I think are uh, another useless platform. I mean, it's just uh, op-eds people do. The majority of them are just taking a side on a media, something in the media. They don't give any forward explanation of what's happening. They're they're censored. If you were too far to the left or, you know, Fox News probably not going to, well, they might now, but if you're too far to the right, it's probably not going to be used. I mean, look what happened in New York Times. They just flipped out because of Tom Cotton's, uh, op-ed that he did and was allowed to go through there. But when we look at uh, the reality of what's happened over the past four years as far as communism goes, I did a, an op-ed that I submitted multiple places when I was hosting, you know, Handy Show, and I did multiple shows on communism when I hosted because I saw it. When I left the FBI, I saw the reality of what was coming. And it just jumped out at me. And a lot of people I know that are still in the government, they just don't see it. They do not see what's happening. But when they get out, totally different story. So I wrote this op-ed and the op-ed was about the only difference between, I mean, this is the, the premise of it, that it, it's speed, speed uh, in, in, uh, in which the communist ideology is being thrust into the nation it's all about speed before the squad and aoc and uh and and communism um took on a new flair with new people and really i would say the department of education how in these education these teachers unions were able to really start pushing this faster and faster as soon as trump got in office radical left started pushing communism ideology faster and faster it came out in the open and why because they made it remember they've been programming people for years and years whether it be in school on mtv uh saturday night live in the regular mainstream media you go to you go to broadway plays you could not turn around without seeing this absolute overwhelming insulting anger against president trump and of course, they use that that display. Like, well, for instance, in Central Park, where they they were doing a play uh, where they beheaded an effigy of the president. See, this thing built up bigger and bigger. And so, what happened while that was occurring, and people felt like, well, it's just a divide between conservatives and liberals, or Democrats and Republicans. That's not what was actually happening. It was a, it was almost like the the switch was flipped for all those people who've been indoctrinated and re, really brainwashed uh, throughout the nation and the world for that matter. But let's concentrate on the United States. They had been brainwashed, and it was as if they had flipped the switch. They for before President Trump, they were figuring out what what is the thing that we're going to be able to just flip the switch and make everybody go nuts uh, f against conservatism so we can start pushing in rapidly this thing that we've been moving slowly over time because in in the op-ed that i wrote 
what I showed was Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and the, and the long-standing Democrats, some of them, and John Lewis, who just passed away um, for 40 years or more. These people have, they have been pushing f- Congress and the Senate and the presidency and the Supreme Court further and further to the left and media further to the left and the ability of people that they had brainwashed to that their opinions will be further and further to the left, away from the Constitution, away from what they understand as politics is, in, in, you know, everyday politics and leadership, what true leadership is, and where we stand in this country about the reality of freedom and understanding of the Constitution. They kept pushing that away. We went from history classes to, you know, U.S. history to civics to, you know, social studies to all these things. They were pushing away from understanding the reality of how the country was formed, why it was formed, and the basis for this great constitution that eventually allowed for all people to be free in the world, really. So the the op-ed, again, that I wrote was talking about how Nancy Pelosi and those people were very slow. They were methodical, the way that they were moving. They moved slowly to the left. Every once in a while, they would do something and say something very dramatically to the left. The 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 uproar would be grand, and then they wouldn't come all the way back to the right or back to where they started. They would then rest further to the left. And so you do that, and it's just like a football game where they're slowly, you know, like, why aren't they passing to get down there, you know, some big passes to get big yards, but you watch and they slowly, 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 you know, move the football downfield to the point where they get right on the goalpost and then they score. And that is, that is what's been happening now when AOC and the squad and these new groups of, of, uh, uh, of leftists got in office when you had not just here, but you also had, or in federal government, but you also had, you know, attorney generals, um, mayors, governors, state representatives, sheriffs, judges, all of them who had moved slow. There was many of them that just did not move fast because that's not the way things were done at that point. But once the, f- the switch was flipped with president Trump, it's as if, the people who wanted to go fast took over. And that's why you had this hiccup with at the very beginning of Trump's presidency with Nancy Pelosi and, and the Congress and some of these other uh, Democrats that supported her, because what you saw was it was almost, you know, when you stir coffee one way and then you quickly stop and try to stir the other way, you know how it, it, before it starts running smooth in the other direction, there's this quagmire where the, where the fluids don't know which way to go because you started stirring the other way. That's what happened. That's what, that's what happened in the Democrat party. And as they started stirring the other way and it caught up more and more speed, what happened was those that believed in moving slow fell into line with what uh, those fast movers of the communist movement were were doing, and so now you have the power of not only um, not only uh, the Congress and the Senate, you have the Supreme Court. Many who you would have thought were conservative coming out, and because it's not that they were conservative, it's that they were moving slowly to the left, and so you were mistaken in believing that they were conservative. John Roberts, for instance. It, it, it's not the Bushes, President Bush and his family. It's not that they were so much conservative. It's that they were used as pawns or willing, you can't be a pawn if you're willing, operatives to move the country slowly and gently to the left. But now that's changed. And that's a catch-22. You know, it, it's, their movement is, is picking up steam because the rest of the population, and this happens historically, they don't see what's happening at first. And then when they do, the left already has, remember the progressives, whatever you want to call them, they already have a stronghold on the legal system, which means if you get arrested, you're going to get charged fully. But if somebody does something else, they're going to be let go. That's that they may have, uh, you know, a, an agreement with with the left, or they may fall into the minority base, for instance, that the left is using. Right? Not saying support. They don't support Black Lives. They use Black Lives to push their agenda. 
So, so all this is all about speed. And it started to move faster and faster. And so when, when I look at how the president comes out, because you just don't find this in hardly anyone, because mostly these politicians, they have something to lose. The president really doesn't have, he doesn't really have anything to lose. I mean, he, he, as far as uh, could he, you know, lose uh, the presidency, I think the more of the stuff that he does that's bold and in your face is going to win him the presidency, just like before. Uh, I'd like to see the wall go into overdrive right now and him come out and say, we're going to build this wall uh, as much as possible before November. You know, I'm going to make sure that this wall gets done now as I roll into my second term that, you know, we won't have to concentrate on that as much and just go crazy about it. You know, I want to see stuff like that. I want to see him do what he did today, which was denounce Black Lives Matter, the organization, as a symbol of hate. Now, it depends on where you read this, of course, um, whether exactly what he said. But um, he, uh, let's see, this is the way Politico is saying it. This is, I'm quoting from the story. President Donald Trump on Wednesday. The only time they call him President Donald Trump is when they're trying to uh, make him sound like he officially said something bad. Have you noticed that? They'll just say the president or Trump. So President Donald, if, if they don't care what he says, that's what they say. President Donald Trump on Wednesday called New York City's decision to paint Black Lives Matter on Fifth Avenue a symbol of hate, rebuking his own town's embrace of a rallying cry that has stirred the nationwide protest against racism. Now, let's break down that statement, okay? The president is talking about what is happening with the group black lives matter they are a marxist group and that was his real comment about this group but the way that they're uh saying it in politico which again is leftist is that he's rebuking his hometown's embrace of a rallying cry it is a rallying cry for those who have no idea what's actually happening and i would have to say that the majority of people don't because of what i just explained with the speed in which the communist movement the Marxist ideology, uh, and let's, we could take all that out and just say this ideology of a communal country, which inevitably will only work out for those in power and usually a dictator. That's usually where this goes to a dictatorial type of leadership. I mean, look at, look at New York State, for instance. Cuomo has basically become a dictator, a soft dictator, right? And that's the way that they work this. It's not about your freedom. It's always about what he thinks is best for your freedom. So, or what's best for his power. Some of these people just like to wield power. They make stupid decisions because they can. But they're saying that he's rebuked, that, that President Trump is rebuking his hometown's embrace of a rallying cry that has stirred nationwide protests against racism. Well, that, that's not true either. But I'll tell you what is true about Black Lives Matter and about the reality of their motivation and the real, reality of who they are and what they do. After the break, we'll be right back. Now, I know you guys hear me talk about my books all the time on this show, but I have to tell you, if you have not ordered Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival, right now is the time when you should be doing that. Honestly, look around. Is anything getting safer in this country? I don't think so. And you need to start taking responsibility for your safety. You may not have law enforcement showing up at your place. So now is the time when you need to assess your threats. Now, the way you do that, the way you assess your threats is you read Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival, and you apply what I teach you in that book. The first half of the book is set up to show you how attackers look at you, why they would attack, who would attack, when it would happen, where it would happen, and how it would be carried out. You divide your life into sectors, and basically, it's not rocket science. You look at yourself from their point of view. I just show you how they do it. The second half of the book shows you how to take what you've learned and then build better defenses, awareness, plans of action, and strategies to mitigate these threats of attack. Sheep no more the art of awareness and attack survival. There's two workbooks that go with it that you can order after that and actually apply it. Workbook number one is the threat assessment workbook. And workbook number two is a defense assessment workbook. So they go right along with the book. 
The first one is like the first half of Sheep No More. The second one is half, like the second half. And then, because I just didn't think that was enough for you to secure your home, I came up with a children's book with Daniel Kreiner, who did the illustration of it. We put safety, communication, and awareness lessons all in the pictures. It's called The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children. And why is it a parent's book for children? Because you go to teamlittlebigs.com and get the lesson plans, hand the book of pictures to your child, and then you teach them two to eight on awareness, communication, and safety. Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival. It's two workbooks and the adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children. This is how you secure your homeland. Black Lives Matter, the group, is a complete Marxist group, right? But the the phrase Black Lives Matter is completely opposite of where we need to be going in this nation. It's being used to divide. That's the absolute truth, and people don't realize that's what's happening. If they really, really wanted to take things beyond where they've come, and we've come a long ways, they would be reiterating what Martin Luther King Jr. said, which is all lives matter. Now, he may not have used those words, but he did say he wanted to live in a, in a world where you know young black people and young white people could play together and that a man is judged by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. We went from that to a point now where you're being told if you don't recognize the color of somebody's skin, you're a racist. So the very term Black Lives Matter is, in fact, pointing out a separation in the nation. Instead of saying all lives matter, we should treat all people equally. That should be the focus. But it, it, Black Lives Matter is an empowerment uh, term that is used by black separatists, uh, black liberation theology, by communism, communists who are using this Black Lives Matter type of phrase to further split the nation. When you look at it for what it says, most people will get behind it and say, yes, all Black Lives Matter. But what they don't realize, and they are being given a mantra of separation. And so the president sees this, he points this out, and he knows that the people that are behind the Black Lives Matter organization are is the Democrat Party and the people that are that are basically gaining power from it are the Marxists. The people who started Black Lives Matter are communists. And he says he goes on to say this will further antagonize New York's finest who love New York and vividly remember the horrible BLM chant pigs in a blanket fry like bacon. And that's true. He went on to write, maybe our great police who have been neutralized and scorned by a mayor who hates and disrespects them won't let this symbol of hate be affixed in New York's greatest street, spending this money fighting crime instead. I, I just can't, I cannot agree with him more in the way that he is laying this out. And I'm not even going to read what de Blasio said because de Blasio uh, is a moron okay de blasio is a communist we've gone through all this stuff with him and the reality of he's changed his name he's done all these different things where uh he basically uh went and supported the communists in nicaragua when we were fighting them uh he he's a big fan of cuba and visited cuba you know with his wife and and russia and i mean you want to talk about ties with russia i mean there you go so I want you to to realize what I'm saying here, okay, that the speed has determined uh, the veracity of speech, has determined uh, not only the speed, but the the grasp that the left had. See, when I say speed, it was moving slowly. They were getting positions. They were getting people. People were not coming out as radical 
before. They were they were running for political office. They would you know work with their constituents. Uh, a lot of them were liberal, or, you know, the liberals on the left. They would work with their constituents. They would get in there, and once they got in office, when Trump came in, it flipped a switch. And, uh, and they took advantage of that. Now, it was Trump. It could have been anything else if Trump hadn't ran for office. Trust me on that. If Hillary would have gotten office, that would have been the thing. They would have just turned radical. The whole thing would have changed overnight. But because she got defeated, they used Trump uh, in order to flip this switch. But see, we can, we can see signs of this everywhere, especially in the way that the media echo chamber is used. You look at the way what happened with Sally Yates is being reported, uh, where she was in front of uh, the, the Senate, and you look at what particular news agencies point out, right? Uh, most of the, uh, the news agencies uh, or networks are saying that, you know, Sally Yates defended the DOJ and their handling of what happened with Michael Flynn. And then in another breath, they're talking about how she criticized Comey as going rogue. And maybe she did say all those things. But I, but I think the reality of when you look at what has been proven as to be correct and not correct, General Flynn has been shown uh, as an individual who was entrapped by people who were trying in the DOJ that were trying to get at President Trump and get him out of office to further this trigger that had been set. But Sally Yates was a part of that. And, you know, like I was saying at the beginning of the show, when you look at Sally Yates, what you come up with is someone who is, she is just a deep stater like I was talking about through and through, the slow mover. You know, she was appointed um, first and foremost uh, she was she's a, a Democrat through and through, right? She's a, her husband ran as a Democrat and lost for for an office. She stated as being a Democrat, and people she's political, right? She's obviously political, um, but she was originally appointed by George W. Bush, which doesn't surprise me at all because he's a closet leftist, just like the rest of these people. I mean, look Look at George Bush 41. Look at how he was as opposed to Reagan. Look at the people that run the Reagan uh, Foundation, people that worked in Reagan's office, now the CEO of the Washington Post. You see, these people are slow movers. They are the ones that chip away. They move that football down slowly down the field in order to get to uh, the end zone and score a touchdown. And then you have the people that are the fast movers who are just constantly wanting to throw, 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 go for that, go for the touchdown immediately. And they have changed the face of how the left moves. When you look at Sally Yates, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at somebody who moves slow. And then when the, when the corruption started, she moved faster. She literally refuse remember when i talked about in one of my shows where i was talking about the true deep state and how there's different levels of deep staters you know there, there's some deep state that are just far leftist uh communist minded people and then there's other people who are career minded and they will do things uh you know to scratch the back of the powers that be that will get them you know jobs afterwards or on boards and things like that or book deals and then there's there's those people who are a part of the left, they're just slow movers, right? I talked about before how a, a senior executive service member who says, you know, who uh, told me outright, I am not a part of that. I was a senior executive service member, but not all SESers are bad. Some of the people actually do get up there for the right reasons. Just like some generals, some admirals are good. The rest of them are just highly political. They're pulled up, not they don't climb up the ladder. They're pulled up the ladder. So when we look at people like Sally Yates and we go back, these other, this other group of people that are these sleepers, they move slow, but they, don't, they do things like the guy that was telling me that was a senior executive service member from DHS was telling me that he had an administrator that sat on, or an executive that sat on a policy that one of the presidents wanted, to, I guess it was Bush, wanted uh, to be put in place 
or maybe Bush did this overtly and then was told told this guy don't don't change it. We're just going to say that we're conservative. I'm just throwing this out there because this is a potential. Um, we're going to you know make a big announcement. DHS is going to do this, and then they quietly say we're not really going to do that. We're just going to say it, and then they sit on the policy and nothing ever gets changed. It's either that. Or it's the fact that there are leftists in office that if they don't like the way that uh, somebody above them is telling them to do something, they just sit on it until they're gone. Usually about two years, they're gone. So that's Sally Yates. She was one of these people. And the, the big thing with her is that, you know, when she uh, was the deputy attorney general and the, the president wanted to... Um, wanted to pass this uh, uh, executive order, uh, 13769, which temporarily banned the admission of refugees and, and barred travel from certain Muslim-majority countries, later to include North Korea. She, um, she sat on that and said, no, we will not do that. And it was on the grounds that terrorists were using the U.S. refugee resettlement program to enter the country, and it's absolutely true. They also use this ridiculous military training where we train people from other countries to come here and we teach them how to bomb and fly fighter jets. It's ridiculous. I don't know why we're doing that. I'm sure that the people from the State Department are the executives that are in, uh, you know, I don't know how they talk, but, you know, these people that are in the upper echelons, lefties, would say, well, that's how we, you know, that's, that's the same thing they say about uh, foreign internal defense where they send us over advisors. It's how we you know, keep a relationship with other nations and measure how good they are. Well, send people over there. Don't bring them over here. We don't need to. We've, the terrorist attacks that we've had in the past year have been from those people that we allowed in, uh, Muslims that we allowed in from other countries, and they end up trying to shoot and kill our own people on military bases. Nobody even talks about that. But anyway, I digress. Sally Yates, in this executive order 13769, um, she just said no. She stated the order was neither defensible in court nor consistent with the Constitution. The Constitution, which talks about American citizens, which has to do with our rights, not the rights of the world. It's not the Constitution of the world, Sally Yates. Interestingly enough, though, after it went through the federal uh, courts uh, and was kind of shot down by them, the Supreme Court then, after you know a few things were changed in it, or I would say uh, revised, they, they affirmed it, and they upheld it, which tells you the reality of either what her understanding is of the law, or she's just that political. Remember, she was a sleeper up to that point. She was a slow mover. And then after all the stuff happened uh, and Trump came into office, she became a fast mover along with all these people who are unmasking uh, different people for, who are being investigated unlawfully by the CIA and the FBI. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, let, let's look at the veracity of, of these fast movers and how it's changed, right? When, when I listen to Ted Cruz, I'm going to play a little bit of what he was saying yesterday um, when he was railing against Antifa and the riots that they're doing. L listen to what Ted Cruz has to say. And those rioters aren't concerned about racial justice. Indeed, they're willing to make a mockery of the peaceful protest to advance their violent objectives. Now, here's where I disagree with the, with the statement. You know, were there some peaceful protests? I guess. But the reality is, those protests are being organized throughout by, as we can, you know, they've been organized since George Floyd's death. Right. And they're now revealing a lot of the stuff about George Floyd, about the, the amount of fentanyl that was in his system was ridiculously high that they couldn't get him to be, uh, to settle down. He was freaking out in the back of the car. Now I still think he was murdered by a, a stupid cop that had been on the force for way too long. And, used a tactic that is typically used to subdue somebody and hold them until you can get them cuffed. And th you're not going to sit on somebody's neck for that long. It's stupid. You're not going to do that unless they are literally out of their mind crazy. Even then, once you get the cuffs on them, if anything, you put cuffs on their, on their legs and you hog tie them 
and you put them in the back of the car. I've seen that. And you leave them there until, uh, until the ambulance gets there. But if they're in distress, like they are on drugs and they are to the point where they are a danger to themselves, you take, you put them in cuffs. If you have to hog time, you hog time, you turn them on their side where they make sure that they can get air because you don't want them to die. That's the thing. You don't want to use tactics after you've subdued a person uh, and you've eliminated the, the possibility of them hurting you or somebody else in, in, in around you, uh, the public at large, you don't want to use tactics that could potentially kill them. But at the same time, you do want to subdue them. All that went out the door when when it came to George Floyd. But the reality is, the the arrest for George Floyd was not quite clear, and a lot of this stuff was uh, basically suppressed by uh, the Attorney General in in Minneapolis, who was also an Antifa supporter. And they use these things again. I'm not justifying that death, but I'm saying they're using these things and suppressing information so that they can create this image of murderous cops. And then all the protests that went on from there, very few of the larger protests did not end with, without violence. They had violence. And it was usually riots. A lot of it was coordinated, very, very well coordinated. And uh, and then you had you know people coming in and looters coming in from other parts that had, didn't care one way or the other. As long as they could get in the stores and steal stuff, that's what they're doing. Right? And, and so... I, you know, I, I, I like Ted Cruz. I like what he's saying. I just don't like calling these other protests peaceful protests because the reality, like in Washington, D.C., you know, they, they show up to push the, the people back. The people won't move and they end up throwing frozen water bottles. Well, that's not a peaceful protest. They were planning on something to happen. Anyway, I'll get back to what he's saying. Their actions are profoundly racist, the rioters, as they destroy minority communities, minority businesses and minority lives across this country. But by and large, they're not destroying minority businesses and societies. I mean, that happened, the initial uh, phase of these riots and protests happened in Minneapolis, and yes, there were minority-owned businesses that were destroyed. But by and large, the majority of companies that have been destroyed have been in nice areas where it's not the inner city, where the interaction between law enforcement and civilians is typically civil that is where this stuff is occurring that is where the damage is happening it's not in minority neighborhoods and minority businesses this shouldn't be complicated peaceful protests must be protected riots must be stopped and i'll go even further again what uh, ted cruz is saying here Peaceful protests, right, just do not have, are not protected by the Constitution when, when they go out and stand and chant on a freeway or where they block hospitals or they target people's homes. That, that is not peaceful protesting. That is using fear, intimidation, and violence for a political aim. And guess what that is? That's the definition of terrorism. And there's a big difference here. There's a, this has to, along with Antifa, which Ted Cruz is talking about, this has to be common verbiage. Just like I always said with the, the war on terror is not a war on terror. It is a war against fundamental Islam. That's why we've never won that war because they won't fight the enemy. They fight an, we're fighting an ideology. No, you're not. You're fighting a group of people who believe in an ancient ideology that believe everyone should submit to this ideology. So you're really fighting those people. And even progressive Muslims won't get in the fight and stop that because, you know, like every religion, you know, it. You said, let's take Mormons, for instance. I don't agree with, uh, with uh, the Mormon interpretation of the Bible, right? But uh, Mormons uh, aren't going to come under fire because of the radical sex of their, of their beliefs, right? Those people who go out and start a cult and have multiple wives, and they all are offshoots of the, of the Mormon church, right? We're not going to go and outlaw uh, the Mormon religion, 
right? But we will go after and name those people who are in these cults. And they'll even say on television, they are an offshoot of the Mormon religion, right? And by and large, Mormons, the Mormon church, denounced those people and shoved them away. It's done right. And that's why they're not prolific. Otherwise, you'd have all kinds of people out there saying, oh, I'm a, I'm a Mormon. That's why I have 15 wives. And then raping and pillaging themselves. But it's not like that. Why, why isn't it like that with Muslims? Well, the same thing, it's because of verbiage. And it's the same thing here. They're not using the proper verbiage. And, I, and I'm a Ted Cruz supporter, but he's not using the proper verbiage. You have to realize that what is occurring are not peaceful protests. And while the, the Constitution protects freedom of speech and uh, your freedom to assemble, it doesn't, it just like the same mistake that's being made when it comes of freedom of the press, people mistake and think that that's freedom uh, or that's pro that means protecting media, the media companies, right? You don't protect the media companies from their lies and from stealing government information and being a part of that or propaganda or subversion. They're not protected against that. People think that they are but they're not protected as far as the constitution goes, right? You understand that? When the constitution was written, besides gossip and horseback, the way that you disseminated information and things that you believed was through the printing press, freedom of the press. People mistake press for media, but it's not. Listen, the printing press, if it's still used, uh, <laughs> computer printing, um, whether it be uh, information that's disseminated online, information that's disseminated in social media, publications, uh, through the airwaves, that's protected speech. But propaganda, lies, subversion, for the use, for, to subvert the government, that is not protected. And I don't, I don't believe, it's not just I don't believe, it's a fact. The Constitution does not, does not lead to the assumption that Pro, that protest means anywhere you want to assemble anywhere you could assemble in on private property you can break down a gate and go and assemble in some in front of somebody's house and threaten them and that's considered a protest that's the constitution doesn't say that anywhere and we mistake this stuff well there were no riots there were no buildings destroyed they just went and shut down a freeway yeah they shut down a freeway kept people from getting to work ambulances from getting to the hospital law enforcement from securing a a, a a city there's nothing in there that protects that well what about the people on the on the ship you know in the boston tea party and they got up there and they did and i mean listen we use that as a way of talking about civil disobedience but the reality is if you go somewhere and you say well you know, black lives matter. So I'm going to go burn down this Wendy's. That is a criminal offense. And although I support what happened in the Boston Tea Party, because they were fighting true tyranny, they were fighting true oppression, and were fighting their way out of that mindset, the reality is now it's not that. These are criminal acts. And they're also acts to help further through, remember, the term of, of terrorism, the use of fear, intimidation, and violence for a political aim. That is what they're doing in order to further a communist takeover of the nation. So it's totally different. And when, when I hear people talk about this, especially those in government, and they're using the wrong verbiage, it's disturbing to me because we're never going to get a handle on it if we keep using this, the wrong verbiage. Let's keep going. No one has a right to assault another person, to firebomb a building, to throw a Molotov cocktail into a police car. True. That's not exercising a constitutional right. That is terrorizing your fellow citizens. It's almost like you listen to me. More and more, we're seeing signs that a significant portion of this violence, of this rioting, is, is not random. It's not spontaneous. Rather, it is coordinated and inspired by leftists, anarchist groups, groups like Antifa, 
that will without shame exploit a national tragedy to attack American buildings, American homes, and American lives. This is happening in my home state in Austin and in Dallas, and it's happening across the country, whether in Minneapolis, Nevada City, Pittsburgh, or Toledo, to name a few. But tragically, nowhere more so than in Portland, Oregon. Now, he's absolutely right about everything he says. I, I invite you to go. I'm not going to make you listen to the whole thing, but I invite you to go listen to what he has to say. The important part of all this, because you and I, if you're listening to this, you know exactly what Ted Cruz is saying. You don't need him to point it out. And by the way, what I just said a few minutes ago, I wasn't condemning Ted Cruz. I'm just saying that people need when, when you hear the verbiage and it's wrong, we need to correct that. T Ted Cruz went on to say it properly, but so many don't. But now, listen to um, Hawaii's representative, Hirono, uh, where she, or excuse me, Senator, sorry, Hirono, as she uh, will not say anything negative about Antifa, and then she gets up and walks out. Senator Hirono. Sometimes I don't think you listen. So, uh, okay. First of all, uh, you know, I, I like to state facts, not judgments. Okay. This is a fact. When you listen to this, she sounds brain dead, like somebody who just graduated high school and somehow got elected as a Senator. That's what she sounds like. Exactly. Like all these other people who have been brainwashed. And I hope if you're liberal and you make it through to this point and you realize that I'm hammering the leftists and I'm hammering you for following this nonsense, I, be I believe in the mind of the human being and I believe in those, whether you consider yourself liberal or conservative, to see where this is going and it's not good. Remember, I always say you can't change a light bulb with an ideology. You can't fix racial problems or anything else with an ideology. We have to look at it and we have to say, we don't have to, to use an ideology. The Constitution lays out free God-granted freedoms so as our guide and the law. But listen to how she sounds. How many times have I had to say that we all should be denouncing violent extremists of every stripe? Does and that include by Antifa? The way, she will not say Antifa. I have the time. By the way, you know, the, the Republicans are constantly using, I have to say, you, you brought it up yourself, the deaths of these black police officers, Patrick Underwood and David Dorn, for uh, making political points and the fact that it was right-wing extremists who killed officer underwood now first of all the, the group that she's talking about the boogaloo boys when you look at what they stand for and you look at what they, they're constantly posting it's not it's not right-wing extremists these are police haters and they're made up of all different races as well but these are people that hate the cops and that is, they're anarchists, okay? Totally different. They try to loop in conservatives and right-wing extremists, right? The, the term right-wing does not describe these people at all. This is a an outdated scale that has nothing to do with what's going on. You have the extreme left or the communist and, and fascist. Well, they say fascist is on the right, right? But the reality is it's totally totally bogus these people are separatists these people are uh uh cop haters they hate government and and just like the communists left they're separatists There's, this whole the way that they formulate this stuff and people sit here and go oh okay i get it they're on the right no that's not true stop looking at the right and the left stop looking at that and then the things that you're told by these people let's go on with this knucklehead man and, and now there are all these attacks about Black Lives Matter and what they're saying. I mean, how many of us even think that defunding police departments is uh, it should be taken literally? I mean, I certainly don't. Well, let's see. You're part of the Democrat Party, and the Democrat Party and many in the Democrat Party are the ones who are saying defund the police. You have Democrat mayors that are taking away from the budget uh, billions of dollars from their budgets of police departments. You have in Minneapolis people from the city council that are saying that they want to abolish police departments. 
this rhetoric that you're hearing by Senator Hirono from Hawaii, Democrat, on the Judiciary Subcommittee is so incompetent and so full of lies. I, I mean, if it was anything else, you'd be fired. If it was something other than politics, you would be fired for the stupidity that she is showing. If you showed up in a meeting with your boss and you absolutely made up stuff, you would be fired. And if you were a doctor, stuff like this would get, would kill, would get people killed. And it is getting people killed because they won't face it properly. So, you know, we have this pesky thing called freedom of speech. And I'd say the, 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 the people who support <laughs> Black Lives Matter and if they're calling for various boycotts and all that, that's called freedom of speech. And that's what this hearing title is, protecting speech. So all I can say is, look, we should all join hands and, and denouncing and uh, <laughs> whatever words you want to use about Boy. violent extremism of all stripes. And I think we... <laughs> She almost went into somewhere where she didn't want to. You can under, you can tell that while she sounds ridiculous and incompetent, she's choosing her words very carefully. That's why she stopped when she said denouncing. She stopped right there. And I'll agree on that. So it's to constantly accuse Democrats of not caring about that is re really uh, I, I I can only say that you, you you aren't listening. So I hope this is the end of this. So she'll talk about the Boogaloo Boys, but she won't talk about Antifa. And she says that that, that was a, a right-wing group, but she won't talk about the leftists, which, again, I just explained to you, it's not a right-wing group. That's just what they call it. But she won't state anything derogatory about a known leftist violent uh, terrorist group called Antifa. Mr. Chairman, and that we don't have to listen to any more of your rhetorical speeches. Thank you very much. I'm leaving. Well, I appreciate the, as always, kind and uplifting words of Senator Hirono. <laughs> so he challenges her right here. Watch. Thank you. And I would also note that throughout her remarks, she still did not say a negative word about Antifa, nor has any Democrat here. Uh, they instead engage in a political game where they depend. You're welcome to say something negative about Antifa right now. Okay, she declined to speak, so that is the position of the Democratic Party. I would note also that of the seven Democratic senators who spoke, not a one of them apologized for or denounced multiple Democrats calling law enforcement officers Nazis, stormtroopers, and Gestapo, to be fair. I don't have not heard the word Nazi, but stormtrooper was Nancy Pelosi, and Gestapo was another Democratic leader. That is less than helpful. I would say less than helpful. I would say that is divisive and that is uh, what, what they're doing and what they're putting out there is subversion. It's active now. They're not even trying to really, this is a forward movement. It's gone further than subversion to the point where now they are actively calling in the past for overthrow of the president. They have actively done covert missions to try and overthrow an election. They are, they overtly, tell lies and use media. I mean, this stuff is, it, this is just another tactic in a real war that is happening in this country. Now, I want to leave you with one last thing here uh, with uh, Jeff Daniels, okay, who is an actor who played in Dumb and Dumber. And uh, that's it. That's his claim to fame. He's, he's an actor and makes believe uh, and plays make believe in, in his entire life, everything he does is make believe. Now he's he's into Kill a Mockingbird. Well, this was last year. I don't know about Broadway. Nothing's open on Broadway now. But he was playing a part in To Kill a Mockingbird. He was playing an attorney, and I and I truly believe because he's been in several of these media type of uh, or attorney type of roles. And I think he, like many people, um, like Charlie, uh, not Charlie Sheen, but uh, Martin Sheen, they start mistaking who they really are in real life, which is people who. Uh, basically are in make-believe world and are actors, they start mistaking their roles for reality and thinking that they they are actually a part of the system and know much more. And then they, they have this aura that they put out there or this persona that they are 
uh, leaders and pillars uh, of the community and that they are exceptional in their knowledge as though they were, I mean, somebody who's a leader in the country. But listen to what he says. This was in uh, May of 2019. What a different world we live in now. But this is what he was saying about the 2020 election. The responsibility. What they get is anonymity. A conscience can be exhausting. It'll keep you up at night. A mob's a place where people go to take a break from their conscience. So he's saying, he is saying that a mob is a place where people to go and take uh, a break from their conscience, right? Now, I'm sure if he was interviewed today, he would not equate what's happening in Portland with the mob, right? But listen who he equates this mob mentality where you go and take a break, quote unquote, from your conscience and go partake in mindless actions. And you lay that line out every night and you can hear them go, oh. No, you know, they, they go, <gasps> yeah. Yeah. And I was sitting there. Yeah. Is that and what's that's happening? What you, that's, what, that's what I see when I look at Trump's rallies. That's when I see the lies spewing at these people and people going, I got to believe in something. And he said he'd bring my manufacturing job back and she didn't and I'm all in. <laughs> Which he did. And no, I'm not mindless. I don't put my conscience or my morals or my ethics to the side for anyone. I vote on president to see if they're if they're going to stick by or any other politician. Are they going to stick by the Constitution, support it and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic? Are they going to leave the Bill of Rights alone and ensure that all people are protected by the Bill of Rights? That's what I'm looking for. And can they fix the problems in this country and leave the other things alone that aren't a problem? Not like Jeff Daniels, the actor who's never done anything in his life except make play make believe is telling the world that those of us that support Trump are mindless and brainless and that we're part of a mob mentality. I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to use the words that I'm thinking right now for Jeff Daniels, but him and the rest of those community of, of the, the actors community that believe in this way or Hollywood in particular, or anybody on the left that, that wants to put me in a category like that or anybody else for that matter that wakes up and loves this country raises a good family morals and ethics who starts a business or who bleeds for this country in training or in battle shame on you jeff daniels and the rest of you this pretentious group of bitches who think that they know better for this country when they are the ones who are blindly following with no conscience, with, with this egotistical, narcissistic mindset that they know better for us without any concept of what the reality of the Constitution is all about, how it was formed, and why it was formed, and what it's done from the point it was formed in, in history to now. sick of it remember when you listen to these people in media these politicians that will refuse to denounce antifa that refuse to point out but in fact use fear intimidation and violence for a political aim that's terrorism folks when you constantly see these people don't forget go and look at who they really are, research who they are. I don't care if they're on Fox News or CNN or if they're a politician elected to the highest forms of government. Go look at who these people are, go look at their history, and if you're a Democrat or a Republican, left or right, conservative or liberal, if they don't stand for the Constitution, if they don't stand for protection of the Bill of Rights, they don't stand for you and they will not protect you. I'm Jonathan Gillum. This is The Experts, The Truth has arrived. Peace and we're out of here.